We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able Amen. of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. He said, let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, wonderful singing that we've heard this morning. I thank you, Lord God, for this passage of Scripture, how it has blessed and touched my heart this week. And Father, I just want to pray, God, that you would just take it now and use it to encourage us, to inspire us, instruct us, and inform us. And Father God, I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to realize that no matter who you are, what you are, where you've been, or what you've done, there is a God that's able, Lord, in the situations, in the lives of these folks, to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask or think. And I thank you, Lord God, today that I can truly say from the bottom of my heart 
that I've got a God that is not restricted, a God that is not held back, but I've got a God that's able to do anything and everything that needs to be done in our lives. And I want to pray that Satan would not interfere with this. I want to pray, Lord God, for a hedge of protection around myself, this church. I pray this building will be filled with your Holy Spirit. All devils of hell will be renounced and rebuked and cast out in the mighty name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus. And I ask God that you would help me to preach this message today and help us to receive it. And if there are anybody here that is lost and without Christ today, or maybe they feel like they've got a problem it's too big, Lord, for you to handle, that you'll reassure them and help them to understand that you're waiting on them in an old-fashioned altar. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I, I want to ask a question this morning. How many of you have ever been in a situation or had a situation come up in your life that just seemed hopeless before? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I mean, we all can relate to something like that. And I, I'm talking about a situation where whenever you look at it, you could not find a way out of it. You could not feel your way out of it. You could not figure your way out of it. I mean, the more you looked at it, the bigger it seemed to grow. And you just could not find a way out of whatever it was that was going on in your life. And whenever you were in that situation, that time of darkness and despair and discouragement, you wondered, is there anybody that is able to help me? Is there anybody that can help me out with whatever it is that I'm going through? It could have been a financial problem. It could have been a physical problem. It could have been an emotional problem. But whatever it was, you just said, is there any way that anybody can help me with a problem like that? I'm talking about a problem of heartache and hardship and heartbreaker. It could be a problem that was a persecution problem. Whatever it may be, you thought there's no way that I can get help in my time of need. Hey, I want you to know that there was a message that was being preached and John the Baptist looked out amongst a group of people standing by the River Jordan and he said something like this. He said, God is able to raise up from these stones a group of people. Now, I don't know about you, but if God is able to take a rock and make a human being out of it, I'm almost positive he can do whatever we need done in our life. I sure am glad that I've got a God that's able here this morning. I've got good news for you. No matter how big your problem is, God is able. I've got glorious news for you. No matter how much you may be thinking, I can't find a way out. There's no help for me. I've got a God that is able today. Thank God that there's a God that is able to help you and I. Hey, I want you to know this. God is able to save any man. Amen. God is able to save any man. The Bible says in Hebrews 7 and 25 that He is able to save unto the uttermost. I don't know about you, but that's good news because some of you used to be in the uttermost and some of you might even have been in the guttermost. Amen. But there was a God that was able to save any man. Hey, whenever I look through my Bible, I find this out. God was able to save a wild man. Some of y'all will be saying amen because you used to be the wild man. Amen. amen. God is able to save a wild man. Listen, there was a man that was in Mark chapter 5 and the Bible takes up and picks up the narrative where he comes and as Jesus is coming to the shore, he comes out and gives a description of him and it talks about how he was demon possessed and he had a legion of demonic spirits in him. And when we look at this man's life, we'll find this, that number one, he was fascinated by death. Hey, there is a morbid fascination among our society today, isn't there? People are fascinated by death. They love movies with death in it. They love songs with death in it. They love news items with death in it. All over our country, people are absolutely overtaken by death. There is a fascination this man had with death. The Bible said he made his dwelling among the tombs. Everywhere he was at, there was death around him. And he was perfectly comfortable with that. He longed to be around it. He loved to be around it. But then number two, he was ferocious in his demeanor. Hey, there was people that tried to bind him, tried to chain him up, but he was so supernaturally empowered and supercharged, he could break the chains. He could not be kept in a prison. Nobody could bind him. And the Bible said nobody could tame him. You ever known somebody like that? <laughs> you ever known somebody in your life, or maybe you were one of them, that was ferocious in your demeanor and nobody could tame you and everybody thought there's no way you could ever get help? Listen, he was filthy in his deeds. I don't know if you know this or not. You hang around dead things, you're going to get dirty. Amen. Hey, let me tell you something. If you're dead and you're trespassing sin, your deeds are filthy in the sight of God Almighty. The Bible says all of our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God. This man's deeds were filthy. But then number four, 
4, we find he was also fixated on destruction. The Bible says about this wild man that he was so miserable that he cried and he screamed and he yelled and he hollered day and night and he took sharp stones and he cut his face and he cut his arms and he cut his hands and he cut his stomach and he cut his thighs. You ever known somebody like that that was fixated on destruction and was so miserable that they cut themselves and hurt themselves? Hey, listen, this man was a mess. This man was a wild man. But I want you to know something. As hopeless as that seemed, as much as his family would have looked at him and his friends would have looked at him and said there's no way that anybody can help that man. Nobody is able. Thank God there was a day when the Lord Jesus Christ came up onto the shore of that particular place. He got out of the boat and there face to face that man met somebody that was able. Somebody that was able to tame it. Somebody that was able to save it. Somebody that was able to deliver it and get it out of the chains and the bondage of sin. How about a God that is able today? Amen. I don't care who you are, what you've done, or where you've been. I've got a God that is able to tame and to save a wild man today. Amen. I don't know if you looked around, but Lee High School is full of wild men and women. This county is full of wild men and women. Hey, I'll tell you, most people about giving up on this place, but I got good news for you today. You may have a family member, a friend, somebody that's dear and near to you, a husband, a wife, a son, or a daughter that may be a wild man or a wild woman. Thank God I've got a God today that's able to save any man. Amen. We just got to get him to the Lord Jesus Christ. We got to stop looking down our nose and start pointing them to Christ. We got to stop looking and pointing and Facebooking and gossiping and use our mouths to get the gospel to us because I got a God that is able to save the wild man. Years ago, in 1969, on August the 8th, a man by the name of Charles Tex Watson was in Los Angeles, California. He and a group of people, part of the Manson family, went into the homes of Sharon Tate and others and absolutely butchered them. When they got through killing these people, the crime scene was so bloody that the detectives that looked and viewed at this thing for years, the, 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 the very images haunted them. Charles Tex Watson was such a demon-possessed uh, maniac of a man that he took the blood from the dead bodies of these people and began to write things on the walls of these homes. And after that night of carnage, he went out and he did the same thing the next day to two other people. Finally, in November of 1969, November the 30th, they tracked him down and arrested him. They put him in prison. And there he stayed and was given the death penalty because of the heinousness of the crimes and the vileness of the crimes and the wickedness of the crimes. And so he was in there. And then in 1972, the state of California abolished the death penalty and he was given life in prison. 1975, he was in his prison cell. He was given a Bible by an inmate that was saved and he was reading it. And he read a passage of Scripture and it was like he said that God had pulled a curtain back. He saw himself for the first time for what he really was. A demon-possessed maniac and murderer. He saw that he was a man that was headed for hell. And he put his faith and trust in Christ there in that cell. Got saved by the grace of God. The devils of hell left out of him. And God sealed him with his own spirit. He forgave him as bad as that was and saved that man's soul. Now does that man deserve to get out? No. He deserves to stay in there the rest of his life. But I want you to know something about him. He founded a ministry called Abounding Love. And through that, he's been able to lead some of the vilest people in the United States of America to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that's good news for you and I. Because if God can save him, and God can save that man I just told you about, God can save anybody in this room and anybody in this county. I'm glad there's nobody that's outside the reach of the saving hand of God. 
also can save a wonderful man. Yeah. I come over to my Bible to Acts chapter 10, and I find a man by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius, when you read the description of this man, he is somebody we would want to join our church. When you go through and you read about him, the Bible calls him a just man. It says that he feared God. It talks about how he prayed. He saw a vision. He saw an angel. He fasted. He gave alms. It was a great giver within the community. He had a great reputation even among the Jews, even though he was a centurion, which would have been like a Navy SEAL of that day. He was a man that was of absolute integrity. He was not a man caught up in scandal. He was not a man that ever was heard to be cussing. He was not a man that not one time had ever done anything inappropriate. He was a man with a pristine reputation. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 11 and verse 14 that God sent Peter to that man as good as he was. And God said this, Peter, go tell that man words whereby he must be saved. As good as he was, he was not good enough to get to heaven. Hey, I want you to know the Bible tells you and I, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves you and I. Hey, that tells me when I look at that man's life, it doesn't matter what you do, how good you are, you still need to be saved by the grace of God. And I've got a God today that don't just save the wild man, but he saves the wonderful man. Wouldn't it be a tragedy for somebody that good to go to hell and somebody that bad to go to heaven? But that's exactly the way it works. Because you got a bunch of self-righteous religious people today they think they're all right because they're not doing what so and so is doing on the other side of town. And they're going to bust hell wide open from a church pew because they've never been born again. Can I tell you, you're born in sin and you are conceived in sin and you live your life in sin because the Bible says there's not a just man that doeth good and sinneth not. Hey, let me tell you something. Everybody in this room needs to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ to get to heaven and God can save anybody in this room. Whether you're a wild man or a wild woman or a wonderful man or a wonderful woman, God can save you this morning. Amen. I think last year, maybe a little over a year ago, I called and talked to Miss Allen's mother. And I talked to Miss Love on the phone. She's in Baltimore, at that time was in Baltimore, I believe. And as I talked to her on the phone, I, I kind of was filling her out to see what her background was. And as I talked to her, she I, and I discussed what she talked about how she said, you know, I've been a, a decent person most of my life. She said, I, I've gone to church, I've been good, I've been decent, I've raised my family right. And that's true, as evidenced by uh, uh, her, her family and everything that's there. And she said, I, I've done, you know, trying to do everybody right, trying to be nice to people. And then talking to her on the phone, I didn't get any indication that it would have been otherwise. I mean, she seemed like a super sweet lady, a super nice lady. But I asked her, I said, Miss Love, I said, can I, can I ask you a question? She said, sure, honey. Just like Miss Allen said, sure, honey. She said, you can ask me anything. And I said, let me ask you a question. I said, can you take me back to a point and a place, not where you went to church, not where you were baptized, not where you were good to your neighbor, but where you realized you were a sinner that needed to be saved, that you actually personally put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? And she said, well, no, honey, I, I can't say that I have. I said, would you like to know? Would you like to do that? And she said, you know what? I sure would. 98 years old. She bowed her head and asked Jesus Christ to be her Lord and Savior. Amen. You can ask Miss Allen. She has not been the same since then, has she? There was something that changed in her heart that made her a new creature in Christ as good as she was. Hey, let me tell you something. She was a great woman. She deserved to go to heaven if you could work your way there more than anybody. But the fact is you cannot work your way there because you're not saved by your works. You're saved by grace and thank God for it because you and I couldn't do enough good to make up for the sin that's in our life. But I've got to go and died for you on Calvary and bore your sin and your shame and thank God on this day He can save you if you put your faith and trust in Him. Amen. I've got a God to save you this morning. And He 
can save any man. Number two, I want you to think about this. I've got a God that's able not only to save any man, but a God that's able to satisfy a hungry man. Now, I, I take you back to the feeding of the 5,000. And when you look at the feeding of the 5,000, you find that uh, they're on this grassy hillside overlooking Galilee. You've got to stand in the very spot where this happened, a beautiful scenery. Grassy hillside, there was 5,000 men, not counting women and children, that were there. They were hungry. They, they, were, they were starving. And there was no food for them except five loaves and two fishes. And the Lord said, bring them forth. And He blessed them and He broke them. And he sent out the five loaves and the two fishes. And as they come back to get more and more, the disciples kept getting more and more and more. It just kept multiplying. You want to know why? Because God's able. Right. It just kept multiplying and multiplying. But here's the part I like. Now this thing is found in all four Gospels. But John chapter 6 and verse 12 is the part that really stands out to me. Because of this. It says, and they were filled. Amen. It didn't say they had enough to keep them going. It didn't say they got just a little bit so they could make it home that night. But it said, and they were filled. In other words, they showed up there that day and their stomach was grumbling and they were so hungry they couldn't hardly stand it. But whenever that day was over with, can't you picture them leaning back on that grassy hillside with their hands behind their head and their belly out like this and they're burping up one side and they got tartar sauce on the other side and they're just thinking, what a great day this is. I'm filled. I'm satisfied. I've been fed. Hey, let me tell you something. God doesn't just give you a little, but he satisfies you and I. Amen. I don't know if you've ever been hungry before. I've been hungry. I thank God. Listen, I am so thankful that He can satisfy your hunger in your stomach. Aren't you? Amen. Now, generally speaking, we think we've been hungry. You know, people say, well, you know, I'm about, I am starving to death. Well, no, you're not. I can tell, look at you, you can last three more days. <laughs> You just think you're starving to death. But I, I will tell you this. Uh, I had never truly been hungry in my life until I was over in the Philippines. When I got over in the Philippines in this particular area, I, I look around and I'm, you know, I have to eat what they're eating. <laughs> and I get over there and, they, and I was the only American they'd seen since the 1940s in this particular area. They hadn't seen a, what they call a white man over there in, in all that time. And so they've got their own diet and all those kinds of things. I promise you, there is no McDonald's. <laughs> there is no Kentucky Fried Chicken. Ain't none of that over there. And so I'm there, and I'm looking across the street. It's 102, 103 degrees. The sun's beating down. I'm looking across the street, and they've got boxes of cut-up chicken. And it's sitting out in the sun because they don't have refrigeration. I'm watching the flies land on this stuff. And I'm talking, I'm standing on the opposite side of the street. I can look across over and I can literally see the flies. That's how many was on there. So you know what I said? I ain't eating that. <laughs> Problem with that thought and that statement was that was the only thing to eat. So I go for about three and a half days or more. And during this time, on that side of the world, everything's flipped upside down. So in other words, uh, it's about 13 hours difference in time. So my time's flipped upside down. It's 103 degrees every day there. I'm riding on the back of a motorcycle everywhere I go because there's no other mode of transportation. I'm holding on with one hand here and my Bible with the other hand here praying that God I don't die. And I'm preaching four and five and sometimes six times a day. And through that heat and all that, I am so exhausted. I'm burning so many calories that I can't hardly stand it. So let me tell you what happened. After about three and a half days, I didn't care if it had flies on it or not, Brandon. I didn't care if they threw a dead possum down on it. I was going to eat whatever was there. More flies meant more filling for my belly is what I'm talking about. I started eating quail eggs, caribou knees. I literally ate a caribou knee. I'm talking anything I could get my hands on because I was starving to death. And you know what? God supplied my need there. I'm here today. I'm still alive. But I will tell you this. I did not get filled up and I did not get satisfied like I do when we go to the fellowship hall and we start chowing down on those things over there. But I'll tell you this. God will supply the need and feed a 
hungry person's stomach. But I got one better for you than that. He don't just feed your stomach, but thank God he'll feed your spirit as well. There's a hole in you that the world tries to fill up with drugs and alcohol and sex and fulfillment out in the world, but it never gets filled. And it's just hungry and hungry and hungry. But I've got a God that'll come along and fill that hole and make you full of the grace of God. Aren't you glad today you've got a God that satisfies just been hungry and your spirit want more. Yeah. More than what this old world has to offer. There's a, there's a man named Michael Latino. This man was born in 1966 with a condition called pica. Pica creates within your brain a signal that produces an insatiable hunger. And in particular it is so bad that these people will not just eat Food, they eat other things. Anything they get their hands on. By the time this man died in 2007, he had eaten um, 15 grocery carts. He had eaten 18 computers. He had, I'm not joking, you can look this up. He had eaten, get this, a, uh, uh, another 18 uh, bikes, bicycles, and a Cessna airplane. He ate an entire airplane. I'm talking a whole airplane. I don't know if you know what an airplane is, but he ate the thing. <laughs> and then he dies of natural causes. I'm not really worried about clogging my arteries up. I'm just going to say after reading that, I do not care less now. <laughs> Give me a pack of bacon. <laughs> And you know, when I read that, I thought, man, is that not a picture of the spiritual part of a person? And how they'll just consume anything trying to fill that void in their life. It's another boy, another girl, another home, another car, a little bit more money, uh, another job. And they think on the other side of that, at the bottom of a bottle, on the end of a straw, snorting a pill, or whatever it may be, at the end of a needle, somehow they're going to find happiness and fulfillment in their life, but it never comes. And they're always on the down and they keep going down because they cannot be satisfied. But I'll tell you this, in June of 1993, I met somebody that filled that hole in my heart and thank God it's been full ever since that day. Hey, I sure am glad. I've got a God that'll fill up that place inside of you. It'll satisfy the hungry man. Some of y'all came in here looking for something today. I'm going to tell you what you need. You need Jesus. Yeah. Amen. He'll give you everything you're looking for. Amen. All the happiness, the joy, all those things you're trying to find, that is what you need this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something else. He'll soothe the broken man. He's able to soothe the broken man. That's right. Come on. Listen, when we look at the life of uh, Peter, and we think about what Peter did, Peter is notorious in the Bible. And I believe when I mention his name, you know exactly what happened with him. On the night that they arrested Jesus, you find that Peter was there. And Peter denied the Lord three times. The last <coughs> time he wanted to get the point across because they said, your speech bereath you. In other words, your speech is giving you away. You talk like one of them Christians. He said, oh yeah, watch this. And he lets out a big blue streak of cussing and said, how's that sound? And he cussed and he swore. And I guess then they said, well, maybe he's not. And about that time he wheels around as he stands outside on the porch of Pilate's Hall and he looks in there and Jesus Christ, after they had smacked his face and they had pulled and plucked his beard out, he looks around and he makes eye contact with Peter. And the Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. I believe as he ran down those steps and listen, I got a chance to walk down that he ran down them steps, and I believe that in his heart, he was saying something like this, man, I fouled up big time. I have failed God. I have absolutely messed up and made a wreck of my life. And if God does not kill me right now, he'll never use me again. There's no way he'll ever even talk to me again. There's no way that God would ever do anything and use me for anything. And the Bible says he wept. I believe he was a broken man. He was a bitter man. He thought that he had 
messed up so bad that there is no way that God could do anything with it. But I find in my Bible that three days later when Jesus came up out of the grave, that he came right to where Peter was at. And thank God he had a meet with him. And when he met up with him, he said, hey Peter, I know you messed up. I know you denied me. I know that you cussed and you swore and you made a fool out of yourself. But I want you to know something, Peter. I still love you. I still yeah. care about you. And I'll still use you if you'll let me use you. Hey, I sure am glad today that no matter how bad you mess up and make a wreck out of your life, there's still a God there that'll use you and help you and comfort you and commission you to do something for you. Amen. And then we find that one of the greatest <coughs> single one-day revival meetings that was ever preached. To my knowledge, I've never heard of 3,000 people getting saved in one day other than in the Bible. And do you know who it was that preached on that day? Why, it was not John the Beloved. It was not Andrew that brought Peter to the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't Thomas. It wasn't Bartholomew. It wasn't any of those guys. But it was the man who cussed and swore and denied Christ. It was that very man that God allowed to stand on that day and preach the truth of His Word. And 3,000 souls were saved in one day. God is able to soothe a broken man. Let me give you one more. Lastly, God is able to stand up a dead man. <laughs> I find in my Bible, John chapter 6 and verse 40, the Bible says this, I will raise him in the last day. John 6 and 44, he says, I will raise him at the last day. John 6 and 54, he says, I will raise him at the last day. He says three times in one chapter, I will raise him up at the last day. You know what? I believe God is able to do exactly what He said He was going to do. I believe He can make a person out of a stone, which by the way, He technically did that back in the Garden of Eden. Amen? I believe if He can make a person out of a stone, He can raise somebody out of a grave. I believe that there's going to be a day whenever God is able to raise up a dead saint. You know, the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise. And that we which are alive and remain shall be changed and we shall be called up together with them in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's coming a day that when your loved ones that you have buried, those bodies are coming up out of the grave. That's not a fairy tale. That's a fact. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus raise people from the dead before he died and rose up from the dead himself? Yep. Well, if he did it before he had the key to death, I believe he can do it after he's got the key to death. You know what he did? He just went and kicked the door down and got him out before. Now he's got the key to it. He can open it and shut it anytime he wants to, okay? But before, the devil had the key. So you know what he had to do? He had to just go knock the door down and go in and say, buddy, I'm going to take this one back out. And guess what? He's God, so he can do what he wants. Right. Amen. But now we're on the other side of the cross, and the Bible says he's got the key to death and the key to hell. One day he's going to unlock the grave, and the soul and the spirit of your loved one is going to be meeting that glorified body, and we're going to be called up, and there'll be no more death or hell or sorrow or any of that stuff anymore. That's right. God is able. Yep. But let me tell you something else. God is able not only to raise a dead saint, but he's also going to raise up the dead sinners. Now, I want to show you this in Scripture, if you would. Go with me to Revelation chapter 20. This time I'll close. How many of you believe God's able this morning? Amen. Saints one day going to raise up the dead sinners. The Bible says this, and I saw the dead, in verse 12, Revelation 20, 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So that's what works is going to get you right here before the great white throne. You better hope you got grace. Amen? Amen? And the Bible says that the sea 
gave up the dead which were in it, death and hell, delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, he's not just going to raise up the saints one day, he's going to raise up the sinners. He's going to pluck them right out of the very bowels of hell where they've been burning from the time they died, lost, until the time of this resurrection that's been spoken of. And when that final judgment's given, he's going to throw them into what's called the baptism of fire in the lake of fire. And that's where they're going to remain for all of eternity. I want you to know something today. God never intended for you to be in the lake of fire. He doesn't want you to be what I just described. He wants you to be with Him. And that's why He sent His Son to die for you. Let me close with this uh, story. Back in the uh, late 1800s, into the, like 1901, 1902 range, there was a brush armor meeting that was going on near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And there was an old circuit riding preacher back then that, that rode around and held these brush arbor meetings and, and he rode on horseback everywhere he went. And right out in this particular town, just on the outskirts of it, they set up a brush arbor in a field and started holding a revival meeting. The preacher stayed with a couple that was part of a local church there. And every day he went to the brush arbor meeting, he'd get on his horse and he'd ride by this particular house on the way to the brush off meeting. There was a man in this house, and I wrote his name down so I wouldn't forget it. This man's name was Chester Bedell, B-E-D-E-L-L. -E -L. Chester Bedell was part of a cult group called the Society of Damned Souls. And as this preacher would ride by on his horseback, this man would throw stones at him and cuss and swear at him. This preacher stopped his horse several times and tried to talk to this man, and he would get run off at gunpoint every time. Finally, on the last day of the brush over meeting, he stopped in the middle of the road on his horseback and he pointed a finger at this man. He said, let me tell you something. He said, if you don't turn from your wickedness, and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will die and burn in hell for all of eternity. That man laughed and he mocked and he said this. He said, if there is a God, if there is a heaven, and if there is a hell. He said, if there's even such a thing as a resurrection. He said, when I die, may that God let snakes cover my grave. That was his very words there. It's verified by his daughter who actually ended up being a Christian. Whenever that preacher rode on, he had the brush arbor meeting, they cleared it out, the meeting was over. 1908, by 1908, this man had erected a statue of himself in the graveyard at North uh, Benton Cemetery, I think is what the name of it was, North Benton Cemetery. It's still there today. Yeah, North Benton Cemetery near, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He had a statue erected there that had him on the on the front uh, or, or as the statue, and it, and it had a little foundation where he's supposed to be buried. And he was holding up a book that he had written uh, that was against Christianity, and under his foot was a Bible, and he was stomping on the Bible, holding up this book he wrote against Christianity. The man died, and one person attended his funeral. They took him and put him in a pine box and buried him. When the uh, groundskeeper came back the next day to put the sod back on the freshly dug dirt that they had thrown over the top of his coffin, it was literally covered with snakes. They killed 12 snakes that day. Do you know that every day since then, that on that one grave in the North Benton Cemetery just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that snakes gather over that grave every day. They have killed thousands of them. And they cannot explain where they came from. His own daughter said in 1932, they interviewed her. And she said, my daddy cursed God. And she said, now my daddy has been cursed by God. And she said, that is a symbol and a sign that you don't mock God. Because that's what my daddy did. 
Can I tell you, God is able. He's able not only to save and to sue and to satisfy, but He'll stand up these people that <laughs> mocked Him and made fun of Him one day, and He will send them to the lake of fire for all of eternity. And ain't a thing they're going to be able to do about it. But you know what? There's a thing you can do about it today. If you're not saved, you better understand this ain't no game. This is a fact. This is real. There is a God that if you don't allow Him to save you, you're going to be judged by him today. God is able. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people do. God is going to be victorious one day because he's able. Now let me ask you a question. And I don't mean this offensively today, but what's your problem? What is your problem today? Do you have a problem with your salvation? Are you not 100% sure you're going to heaven? If that's your problem today, God is able to save you. Do you have a problem in your home, a problem in your life, a problem in your body? God is able. Is your heart broken? God is able. Do you have a void in your life? God is able. Do you need something to be supplied? I'm not talking about a wall, but I'm talking about a need. Listen, God is able today. Man, there is nothing that He is not able to do. And if you need to be saved today, He's able to save you. He said, Preacher, you don't know what I did. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. I've blasphemed God. I've done a God is able to save you today. But you've got to come to Him. Let's stand to our feet. Whatever your situation, God is able. No matter what's going on in your life, God is able. It could be a family problem, a marriage problem, a home problem, but God is able. Hello, my name is Charles Barrier, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church here in Pennington Gap, Virginia. Thank you for joining us today. I hope the message that you just heard was both inspiring and a help to you in many ways. I want to take just a moment before we depart to ask you a very important question. And the question is this, are you 100% sure that you're saved, that you're going to heaven when you die? If you're not, that is a very important question that you need to answer. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. If you don't know 100% for sure that you're saved, the good news is the Bible says you can be. In 1 John 5 and 13, the Bible says this, These things have I written unto you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. You say, how do I know that I've got eternal life? Well, you've got to come to this agreement that you're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. The Bible says also that there's a sentence for your sin. In Romans 6 and 23, it says the wages of sin is death. Now there are two types of death in the Bible. There's an earthly death, but there's also something far worse, and that is an eternal death. The Bible says in Revelations chapter 20 and verse 14, that the Bible says this, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is a death that is perpetual and goes on throughout all eternity. It's a death where you don't burn up, but where you burn as a payment for your own sins. But here's the good news. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said this, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, if you know that you're a sinner and you know that you need to be saved and you're not 100% for sure that you're going to heaven, the Bible says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that he was buried and that he arose again on the third day? If you do, then you believe the gospel. That is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the next step is this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you ready to take that step right now? Are you ready to turn from your sin and turn to the Savior and ask Jesus Christ to save you? If you are, then right now where you're at would be a great time to do that. 
Now, if you don't know what to pray, I would like to help you with that. Because it's not a magical prayer that saves you, but many people are oftentimes uncomfortable with praying a particular prayer or just not knowing how to pray. So maybe you would like to pray something like this with me from the very bottom of your heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. Jesus, will you please forgive me for my sins, wash me in your blood, and save my soul from hell, and be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Now, if you did pray just right then and there and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, and you meant it from the very bottom of your heart, we would love to help you in your new walk with the Lord. We would like for you to call the number that is on the screen and leave us a message and let us know that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Leave us an address, a phone number, so that we could contact you. We would like to send you a Bible and some materials to help you in your walk with Christ. And we would like to rejoice with you. And we thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.